Today on Day of Discovery, In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon. Hi friends, welcome to In His Footsteps with Day of Discovery. I'm Jim Cantillon. Today we begin the story of Jesus' passion, those last few hours before he was crucified. It's a gripping story and it has gripped the world ever since it first uh, took place. We'll be going through the scriptures, we'll take our time with it, and from the Garden of Gethsemane, you're going to have a feel for it, perhaps like never before. And once we finish the study part of it, Claire Fon, Dr. Claire Fon is going to join me, a brilliant university professor, someone who knows this story so well and the background to it, and all together, this half hour, is gonna be well worth the watching, so you hang in there with me. We're starting a study of the passion of Jesus. And right off the top, we need to understand that the passion, as we call it, basically means suffering, the suffering of Jesus. And what he went through, especially the last two days before his crucifixion. Let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is an historic site. I'm in an olive grove right here, very, very similar to the Garden of Gethsemane. I like this grove because it's a little younger. The trees around me are maybe a thousand years old. The, the trees currently in the Garden of Gethsemane may be 2,000 years old. But here you get the feeling. This is a, a beautiful facsimile. Gethsemane means oil press, essentially. And Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a corner of the uh, garden to pray. Now, he takes Peter, James, and John, I think for a number of reasons. One being that they were sort of the, uh, the inner cabinet, if you will, of his 12 disciples, especially because they had been with him when he was transfigured. You remember the story of the transfiguration? It was either Mount Hermon or Mount Tabor. I personally think it was Mount Tabor in the uh, Lord Galilee. Uh, beautiful mountain just rising, it seems, out of nowhere. But regardless of where it physically happened, it was an actual event where Jesus was transfigured before these three men with Elijah and, Mo and Moses in conversation. You've read about it, I'm sure. So anyway, it's these three who had seen him there in that transfigured state who now come with him to pray just before his crucifixion. And when Jesus says he's sorrowful even unto death, you know that he's sorrowful even unto death. This was a heartbreaking experience. And there are many who observe that perhaps when Jesus did die and blood and water came out of that spear's hole in his side, this was indication of what's called a broken heart. As he converses with his heavenly father, there is something deep within him, it's that human side of him, that wants to avoid this. He's agonizing over what he is about to face and also about what he's 
about to take on, taking on the sins of the entire world on himself. But the resolution of his agony is not my will. Thine be done. I am here at your behest. I'm not here to seek my own comfort or pleasure. I don't know if we should be too hard on the disciples. They're sleeping while Jesus is going through this. Now, it's the middle of the night. In fact, it's getting close to the early morning. They haven't slept. They've been, you know, in an intense few hours with Jesus, and they're just basically fatigued. So they sleep. He tries to wake them. He does wake them. They go back to sleep. Eventually he says, you know what? Sleep on. The uh, spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And that's a saying, of course, that has transcended the Bible, and you hear it all the time in every kind of context. But then there's action. Suddenly there's torches and there's a sound of rattling weapons and the trod of many feet. And there's this group coming up to the garden out of the Kidron Valley. And Jesus wakes his disciples. He said, okay, guys, it's time to go. My hour has come. My betrayer is at hand. The betrayer, of course, was Judas betraying Jesus, number one. It, it seems like impossible. How could anybody betray Jesus? And I, I'll get to that in a minute. But to betray him with a kiss? It's a, a dramatic moment for sure, but it kind of tears at the heart to see the master of mankind, the creator of all that is, the son of the living God, fully God, fully man, being betrayed by one of his own with a kiss. Peter slashes out as these guys approach. He had a sword, and he wanted to take that one guy's head right off. Misses, hits the ear, Jesus picks up the ear, heals it. That's in another one of the references to this event. But occasionally, as you read this story, you keep seeing the scriptures must be fulfilled. And what scriptures were being fulfilled in this case? Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. Again and again, the Old Testament prophets picked up on some of what was about to happen. The lamb was about to be led to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Judas, what was he up to? A lot of commentators think that he was trying to force Jesus' hand. He believed Jesus was Messiah, at least in terms that he understood Messiah, meaning that he would establish a throne in Jerusalem. He would rout the Roman occupying forces, and he would establish a kingship that would rule all of Israel and eventually rule all of the world. And there are those who think that Judas thought that Jesus just needed a bit of a push. I don't know. It's a theory. But he may have been trying to force Jesus' messianic hand. We'll never know. It's interesting, however, that he brings with him both temple guards and Roman soldiers. What does this tell us? It tells us that there was some collusion between the priestly elite, the Sadducees, and Pilate. Now, this was an unusual thing. These people were at odds with one another all the time. Everybody hated Pilate, hated the Roman occupiers, and the Sadducees were pretty much despised by the Pharisees because the Sadducees were the spiritual elite and they ruled and governed the temple and all of the temple economy. And so it was in the Sadducees' interest to see the Romans routed. It was in the Romans' interest to see the Sadducees quenched, but they come together because they both want to get rid of Jesus. So there they are. Sadducee, the priestly elite, and Pilate's men. What do the disciples do? They forsake him and flee. I mean, hard to believe. Jesus had anticipated this. In John 16, he says, you will leave me alone. You will leave me alone. Yet, I'm not alone. He says in Mark 14, you will all fall away. And they did. But eventually they saved the world through the power of Jesus' spirit. In a moment, Claire Fawn is going to join me. Dr. Claire Fawn. She is a brilliant uh, university professor very well versed in the scriptures. She's a personal friend of mine, and she will give us input and perspective that will really add color 
to this account. Stick with me, back with more after this. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. It's early evening. I am sitting within the old city walls. The Western Wall is just a few hundred meters over there. And you can hear in the background another bar mitzvah happening. This is bar mitzvah day in Jerusalem. So enjoy the ambient uh, rejoicing behind me. Professor Claire Fon is with me. We're talking about the last few days and hours of Jesus' life, the Passion. We're gonna split it into two parts so we can cover it uh, with a measure of satisfaction. But Claire, let's talk about Gethsemane. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane uh, is just, <laughs> our viewers can't see it, but it's just over there. It's just a few hundred meters from where we're sitting. Uh, it's in the, on the other side of the Kidron Valley. Uh, familiar territory to Jesus. Uh, Bethany is on the other side of the Mount of Olives. Uh, he had traveled, you know, probably through the garden many, many times, spent a lot of time there praying. But this is different. What's happening in this, on this occasion? Well, the, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane follows immediately after the Last Supper. Right. And at the Last Supper, Jesus is saying farewell to his disciples. He's preparing them for the trauma that is about to happen. So first step, prepare them, tell them that he knew what would happen before it happened. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew they would all flee and he gives them a memorial dinner or a memorial celebration of the cup and the bread to remember him by. This is a Passover type of memory because Passover is celebrated with a memorial meal. Yeah. So, and he tells them how much he loves them and he tells them what their organization should be like. They should serve one another. Having prepared them to the best of his ability, they go up to the Mount of Olives to a garden that is familiar and he asks them to pray. Now in, the, in Mark and, and uh, Matthew, he separates the three from the eight. In Luke, he doesn't separate, he makes no distinction and he says, pray with me, watch with me. And then he goes off to pray himself because now he has to prepare himself. Yeah. That's what the garden is about. It's about stealing himself for what lies ahead. And he really suffers. He really uh, I suffers. mean, passion, uh, pa passion means suffering. He really suffers. He's going through an agony here. Um, had he become increasingly aware, you know, in earlier programs, we talked about the kenosis, the emptying of himself, uh, of the godlike exercise, or the exercise, the independent exercise of his godlike attributes. Is he becoming more and more aware of uh, what he's about to face? I mean, he'd been warning the disciples that he's going to be killed. Yes. Um, is it just hitting him now that this, this is it? Or is there something else going on? Well, I think that we see, that, first of all, this understanding that in order to be the Messiah and savior of the world, he must die, yeah. has been something that he's recognized since about the midpoint of his ministry. And he makes an effort to teach the disciples this, but they are not getting it. They never understand it. Um, and even though intellectually Jesus himself may say, I know that this has to happen. It's one thing to say, oh, okay, in a few years, I'm gonna to go to a cross. It's another thing to be on the night before and actually facing the fact that you're gonna experience torture and death yeah. because Jesus is fully human. Yeah. I mean, he is tested in all things as we are. That means including the fear of pain, the fear of torture, the fear of death. And so it's not a small thing. He could he could go right over the back of the Mount of Olives and disappear into the Judean wilderness and never face this. Yeah. So the Garden of Gethsemane is the, is the place of showdown in a sense. And the word that you said, you know, he was in the agony in the garden. The Greek word agonia, from which we get agony, really also is a, it's a term from sports, it means the wrestling arena. Mm. It's a wrestling arena, is it the agonia? And and it, it's a very fitting picture for what he is experiencing. He is wrestling with his own fear and his own ability to face this. So much so that Luke says his sweat became like great drops of blood. Uh, in Mark and Matthew, he goes, we have a sequence of him going back and forth three times and praying. In Luke, he we just have the prayer, you know, consolidated into a yeah. single moment of prayer. And um, even though he's asked the disciples to pray with him, they fall asleep. 
Luke says they fall asleep for sorrow. Mm. Probably they actually had too much wine, but oh. they fall asleep for sorrow. And that's because we also pick up on, an, on a note within the gospels that they realize that something bad is gonna happen in Jerusalem. In the gospel of John, before they go up, uh, Thomas says, let's go up to die with him. He, this is in John chapter 11 when they're gonna go back and, mm. and raise Lazarus, but he, they know that violence is there, that it's not a safe place for Jesus and that no prophet you know, dies except in Jerusalem. That is a destiny point. So Jesus is experiencing his own struggle to come to that place of inner resolve to be able to lay down his life freely and have no one take it from him. But I appreciate the fact that it was not something that he could just do, that he had to struggle. You know, even in his moment of agony, he looks at his sleeping disciples, shakes his head and says, you know, spirit is willing, flesh is weak. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, it's almost a kind of a sardonic comment, maybe a half grin. But then he says, OK, guys, let's get up. Let's get up. Let's, Let, let's just get, let's get this over with here. Mm -hmm. um, the impulsive Peter in one or two of the accounts in the Gospels yes. takes a sword and tries to cut one of the, uh, we don't know if it's a temple guard or one of the Roman soldiers, tried to cut his head off, swung at him. Yes. The guy ducked and he just got his ear. Jesus yes. picks it up, heals it, says, put your sword away. Yes. Um, I suppose we would expect this of Peter. Yes. You know, he he's, um, He's really the alpha male, isn't he, of the, of the, of the disciples. I mean, yes. he's, he's the most impulsive one. He's the loudest one. He's the one that, you know, took the first step out of the boat when Jesus was walking in the water. He's the one that says, I'll never, ever betray you. I'll, I'll go with you, you know. And he's the first guy to uh, run and hide. Um, but I'm sure that not just Peter, but all of them must have been totally confused and even terrified of what's going on here. Yes, and imagine the shock for them when it's Judas who brings the arresting party. Right. That one of their own is the one who has betrayed Jesus. So, yes, and at the, at the table, at the Last Supper, Jesus says to them, you remember how it was when I sent you out and you healed people and everybody loved you and they showed you hospitality and you didn't have to take anything with you because my good name, my reputation went with you and people received you. He says, it's not gonna be that way anymore. Now you need to take a bag with money. You need to take a cloak and you need to take a sword because I am going to be numbered among thieves. He quotes from the Psalms, but it means that because Jesus's reputation will now be sullied, he'll die as a rebel against Rome. He'll die as a criminal. They need to be self-protected. Doors will be closed to them. There won't be hospitality. And so when he says, and you need to take a sword, then they hold up two swords and they say, here, master, we have two swords. So when they act out, when Peter jumps up and starts fighting, it's as he, he may just be responding to what yeah. he heard at the table and thinking this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I love Peter. Yeah. You know. Yeah, don't we all? I, uh, he was a man of action and ready to yes. take on the world. Yes. Um, what's going on in Judas's mind? Oh. Uh, he, he's, he's not doing it for the money. No. Because he throws the money away. Mm hmm do you think he's trying to force Jesus, uh, the scatological hand, trying to force him to call a thousand or 10,000 angels, force him to establish the throne, force him to be who they all hoped he would be? What do you think? Yeah. It's really a mystery. And I think that kind of suggestion is one viable thing to examine. Yeah. Yeah. He's not happy with how Jesus is leading the movement. He wants to see something else. He wants to crank it up a notch or he just wants to get Jesus to talk to the Sanhedrin, to talk to the priests and the uh, Pharisees to somehow get a reconciliation by trapping them together. We just don't have a clue. It, it, nothing is told to us. It's a pathetic story. Yeah. You know, he, he goes out and he realizes what he's done, throws the money uh, back at the priests, mm -hmm. uh, and goes out and hangs himself. Yes. So if he goes out and hangs himself, clearly this was not the outcome he was expecting. And clearly he is suffering from some type of emotional or mental illness because you don't just hang yourself. No. It's, it's an extreme reaction. So I think that we have to understand then that the same kind of befuddled thinking 
also influences his decision to betray Jesus. I mean, it says that Satan prompts him to do this, that he's a victim of demonic oppression. Yeah. John gives us some delicious hints. He never comes out and says it. But that, you know, when Jesus is being tried and Peter is denying him, he's in there. It, 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 am, I, am I right? Like he, there is a disciple in the midst who's, oh, who's, who's nameless, and he refers to himself sometimes. I think he's referring to himself as a disciple yes. that Jesus loved. I do too. Uh, you know, I, it's very obscure. So, am I on on the on, on the right track there in terms of thinking that maybe John was in the midst while Jesus was being tried, or, or not? I think that the, gospel, the author of the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple, yeah. is what he calls himself. He yeah. never says his personal name. No is an eyewitness he, yeah. from the Last Supper yeah. where he sits next to Jesus right. to the garden, that he is he has access because yeah. he's recognized by people at the high priest's house and he witnesses this interrogation. He stands at the foot of the cross and he is with Peter at the empty tomb. That's right. And I'm wondering why he wasn't running for his life and cursing and denying Jesus like Peter did. Why do you suppose John was able to get away with it? Yes, well, the fact that he is not seen by public at large as the appointed successor right. would probably have- He a was the kid, play. right? He was probably the, the youngest kid, one. And Peter is understood by the public at large to be yeah. the, next, the next successor, the right-hand man of Jesus. So this is a younger person and he's known to the people at the high priest's house. So he must have yeah. some type of entree that, you know, he's a known figure to them as opposed to someone like Peter who is brash, who's a mature adult, who's powerful and in, 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 in his, you know, persona and who Jesus designated, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will you know, build my church. Build my church. Yeah. Was Peter the rock, Petros, Cephas, the stone, or was his confession of faith the rock? Well, I think the answer is yes. Both. Peter, not all the popes who come after him, but right. Peter was designated by Jesus to be the primary apostle right. for his succession. And the rock is the confession. Right. That is not the same as saying that this means that we have a Bishop of Rome who is no. the Pope forever. It's, it's, I mean, that's a big extrapolation, but certainly Peter in that generation is recognized by all of them as the primary apostle. You know, friends, I hope as you're watching this and listening to Professor Fun, you're, you're getting intrigued. Uh, it may be a while since you've read your Bible. Maybe it's time to pick it up. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel writers. Appreciate their various perspectives. Thank God they don't all say the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they did, it would be just an act of collusion, yeah. and I wouldn't trust it. But they each give their own perspective, their own, you know, hermeneutic, if you will, their own lens on the scene. And it's absolutely gripping, but without doubt, the greatest story ever told. Okay, we're going to take a little break here, and after the break, I'm going to come back and close the show. I referenced some of the scripture which I have yet to read in the Passion Story, and timing being what it is, I can't read the whole thing. But I talked about Judas, I talked about the betrayal with the kiss, I talked about Peter and his sword, but I, I wanted to get to this. Jesus says, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions? I think that's 12,000. 12,000 angels? One measly sword? <laughs> that's all you've got? I got 12,000 angels on my side, but I'm not going to call them. I'm going to submit to this very unjust process. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, basically. I'm going to let them misrepresent me. I'm going to let them speak of me evilly. I'm going to let them hit me. I'm going to let them put a crown of thorns on my head. I'm going to let them lacerate my back with a cat of nine tails. I'm going to let them crucify me. I'm going to let them do this to me instead of calling 12,000 angels. Friends, we're talking here about Jesus, not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God. That's what makes it such a powerful story. Why did he do it? Why did he condescend to our low estate? One reason only. And the scripture captures it so well in John 3 and 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If day of discovery is about anything, friends, it's about the discovery of a Savior. Jesus, who came into the world and died that we would not have to, took our sin upon himself and has saved us from our sin. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.